Well, thank you very much for the invitation to join you all today. And I wanna uh, also particularly thank Joanna for all her hard work and great communication as we were getting this planned. As she mentioned, um, I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Deborah Herman. Didi and I both are on the faculty within the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at George Washington University in Washington, DC. And we are going to be discussing our work in interprofessional education and the use of design-based research as a model for curriculum development. I'd also like to just uh, acknowledge our collaborators who um, have worked on, a, on this project with us and will continue to be involved um, in, the, in the coming uh, future. So today we wanted to start by uh, just a very brief overview of interprofessional practice and education. I know that um, probably most of you or all of you are expert in this area as well, but just wanted to lay a foundation for our discussion today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in IPE design that have been discussed in the literature. And then the design-based research model is a potential way to overcome these challenges. And we're gonna do that in the context of discussing our own course um, that we have recently um, designed and which is actually included, concluding next week uh, for the spring semester. So just as some background, um, certainly healthcare has become increasingly challenging in the last couple of decades in particular. We know that worldwide we have an aging population who face more chronic health conditions as opposed to acute ones. And so healthcare delivery um, requires a lot more resources and time and effort uh, to caring to people over their advancing age. We also fortunately have a lot of new treatment options available, both um, pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, but that adds to some of the complexities of healthcare. Just as an example, from the time that I um, studied medicine till now, there have been a, double, a doubling in the number of pharmaceutical agents approved for use in the United States. Um, so there's a lot for people to know and really uh, more than any um, one type of professional um, can know. There have also been a number of reports um, that have illustrated the um, large number of medical errors that occur within hospitals. Uh, the landmark study out of the U.S. Um, entitled to Air is Human estimated that up to 100,000 medical errors occur in hospitals alone. And studies since that time have actually suggested that that number is likely higher. The importance of that study was not only in illuminating the issue of medical error, but really uh, focusing on the, um, the systems approach to thinking about medical error. Not that these are about individual providers' mistakes, but um, how we need to function within a larger healthcare um, system to ensure that these types of errors do not occur. And then we also know that there are a great deal of um, shortages in healthcare uh, workers throughout the world. And um, the traditional model of a doctor and nurse team um, is one that really has become outdated. Fortunately, we have lots of different additional types of healthcare professionals who help to fill those shortages, but it just adds to some of the complexity around healthcare delivery. One of the models for improving quality of healthcare is uh, the triple aim. The, this focuses on the goals of improving the population of our community, the enhancement of the patient's experience around healthcare, and at the same time, reducing healthcare costs. And one of the ways to help meet those aims is by interprofessional collaboration in which we are working in efficient and effective healthcare teams where professionals are functioning at the highest extent that they are trained um, to do and um, that it is a well-oiled machine in the delivery of healthcare. However, we know that healthcare professionals um, traditionally, and um, is still the case in most settings, they're trained within their own unique healthcare, um, health professions programs. 
Um, doctors are trained with other doctors, by other doctors, and the same is true across most healthcare professionals. And so the idea of siloed approach to um, health professions education is one that raises concerns about how do we ensure that people are, are ready to work in effective teams if in fact they have not been trained to do so. So this is where the model of interprofessional education has emerged. This is a concept that has been around for a number of decades, but in the last 10 to 20 years has become the dominant pedagogical approach um, that is advocated for helping professionals learn how to collaborate. And as I'm sure you know, this is defined as when students of two or more professions learn from, with, and about each other to enable effective collaboration and ultimately improve health outcomes. However, interprofessional education also faces a number of challenges, both in the design and in the delivery. From a design perspective, some of the concerns that have been discussed in the literature are the lack of effective faculty engagement that is interprofessional in its, um, in its design. The lack of relevant theory that's used to inform the design of interprofessional education and the um, lack of attention to the evaluation of IPE, particularly linked to the important key outcomes, as opposed to um, short-term uh, types of evaluations that only look at student satisfaction as an example. So the ways to overcome these challenges are to use theory to uh, inform curriculum design, to ensure that planning is interprofessional, and to ensure that curriculum evaluation is done in a way that really can inform curricular revisions. I've mentioned theory a couple of times, and why is theory so important in educational and curriculum development? Well, certainly we have educational theories, models, and best practices that have been well vetted in the educational research literature that can help us to um, design programs that are effective. And furthermore, educational research must be grounded in relevant theory if it is gonna actually inform um, practices that are generalizable or transferable to other contexts that are relevant to the local context where these uh, initiatives uh, currently are typically performed. So uh, an approach that we identified uh, from the literature to help guide our work is design-based research. Design-based research is an iterative approach that uses a curriculum development, evaluation, and revision. It involves collaboration between practitioners who are knowledgeable about the educational needs of our, their students, educational designers who have expertise in curriculum development, and researchers who are um, knowledgeable about relevant theory as well as um, appropriate practices in research methodology. It requires that curriculum and evaluation be guided by theory, and in addition to being a curriculum design approach, it also can be used to test and refine theory. Now, uh, DBR um, can be used primarily uh, from a research perspective as a way to uh, validate or um, uh, refine theories. It also can be used more towards uh, the um, use and development of educational initiatives. And so for our discussion today, we have used it so far primarily from a developmental perspective, um, but we also can talk a little bit about ideas and how this model can be used in um, actually helping to advance theory. The other thing I'll mention is that design-based research requires a mixed method approach to evaluation so that we not only identify um, you know, whether something was effective or not, but we can actually explore the how and the why questions about um, the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of a particular intervention. So the DPR process is one that's fairly straightforward. 
For those of you who know the PDSA cycle that's often used in healthcare quality, it's a similar approach. You start with an approach of analysis, then that analysis can include um, identifying relevant theory to your initiative, but also um, understanding the educational needs of the students that you are um, going to be teaching. Then a phase of design, of implementation, and of evaluation. But the key part of this is the arrow in which the evaluation then informs the analysis and redesign for future iterations of the uh, initiative. Great. Thanks, Mara. So I'll outline the specifics about the interprofessional collaborative practice course that we design using the DBR process. Uh, this was a new course uh, within the Doctor of Health Sciences in Clinical and Academic Leadership Program at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. This course included a cohort of interprofessional students and faculty. So first, let me start by telling you more about the members of the DBR team. The team consisted of five members, all but one of our members are clinicians. So we had one physical therapist and three physician assistants. Members of our team served in various leadership roles at our institution. Among our team, we have program directors, we have clinical administrative director, and then we do have two academic department chairs on our team as well. All of our team members are educators and with, with many years of individual and combined experience. And lastly, all of our members are um, on our team are scholars in educational research with expertise in various different methodologies. So even though we worked as a cohesive team, each person had a specific role to play on the team. And for instance, Mara was the course director and as the leader of the DBR team, she kept our process going and helped us stay on task. Whereas I was the uh, educational design expert on the team and in my role, I, I I was um, mainly there to ensure that the course activities and deliverables were aligning with our course learning outcomes. So if we move on to uh, the design process, um, in our design process, you know, the course director is really the leader of the DBR team. And that's important because that person is accountable for getting the course started and delivering the course. And so it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense that they're gonna be the person who is ultimately the leader of the team. We had regular DBR team meetings. Um, many of our meetings occurred prior to the start of the course that we were designing, um, but we also maintain our meetings throughout the course's implementation. And we'll be having a lot more probably, me you know, uh, not probably, but we will be having a lot more meetings after the course has concluded next week because that will, you know, start our revision uh, process. And so uh, during the course, when issues arose outside of our regularly scheduled DBR team meetings, uh, we would, uh, you know, just go into email communications for that just-in-time feedback and discussion that was needed to overcome any challenges um, or questions that we were experiencing through this process. Uh, we used a few different guiding uh, conceptual frameworks as we designed the course. So we used, of course, the, um, the IPEC com competencies. We also uh, used social learning theory, interprofessional socialization theory, and the value creation framework. And we used all of these conceptual guides during our DBR process. As far as our course learning activities, they included weekly readings, online discussion boards with peer and faculty feedback, self-assessments and personal reflections, and a culminating end of course project that was broken down into smaller individual assignments where learners would receive um, formative feedback from the course director to ensure them that yes, you know, this is sort of a shaping up to be exactly what I was looking for and you're, you're on the right track. Um, and our social learning activities for the course were really the online discussion boards with peer feedback. So the course currently is in its final week of content and next week we'll start the evaluation um, process. For all course, uh, you know, unfortunately we are, um, 
we have to use the university standard course evaluation. And because we really don't believe that this standard evaluation provides the detail uh, we're looking for regarding the DBR process used to design, implement, and study this course, we did create a course specific evaluation that was guided by a value creation framework and uses um, a mix of both qualitative and quantitative measures. So we can really get at um, what was effective, um, what wasn't affected, what worked, what did not work, and we can utilize that information when we're trying to determine what revisions we want to make for the next iteration of this course. So once the course evaluation results are available, the DBR team will meet on a regular basis to do an analysis and determine needed course revisions. And so we'll share ideas, um, we'll share opinions, we'll uh, look at the opinions from the students and the learners that were you know, directly involved in the course. And we'll come up with recommendations for revisions that we wanna make. And um, at the next offering of the course, it will be the course director's responsibility to implement these changes, and then we'll engage in this process all over again. So um, we have, um, again, been looking at this really from a design perspective. So um, the team has talked a bit about how the DBR process has worked for us and what we have found to be particularly useful about this approach um, is that it is it requires an interprofessional approach. It requires collaboration with the team. We also felt, as Didi suggested, that it was really important to have somebody who was accountable for the work and ensured that the, the team stayed on task and that deadlines were met. And so the course instructor, who ultimately is responsible for the course, um, was felt to be the right person for that. Um, it also, again, requires that we really identify relevant theory and we continue to use that theory during our um, deliberations and that the process is an iterative process. Um, certainly, the members of the team have used a variety of other curriculum development approaches, and um, those can be used um, as well, um, but um, this would be a really important approach to help ensure that these challenges in IPE have been um, addressed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we um, so far have not designed a formal research study around this work. However, we've been exploring a variety of different topics and concepts and questions that we um, would be interested in potentially asking of our data. And because we're collecting rich mixed methods data, both through the evaluation, but also through student reflections, class uh, discussion boards, we have a lot of data. Um, our current cohort is five students, but we're anticipating in the future that there will probably be 15 or 20 students in a cohort. And so after one or two additional iterations, we would like to explore some questions around topics such as um, social learning, social learning facilitation, um, interprofessional identity formation, and things like that. So really just in conclusions, um, we would recommend that any IPE initiative be designed by an interprofessional team using evidence-based approaches to curriculum development of, and evaluation, and that revisions be used to inform um, course of uh, that evaluations be used to inform course revisions. And we felt that more than other models of curriculum development that we have used and continue to use, that DBR is really unique and that it requires the inclusion of an interprofessional team that includes practitioners, designers, and researchers, and that at least, uh, at least a member of the team is knowledgeable about theory and that team members are also knowledgeable about uh, professional practice of their students. And so we would suggest that instructors consider using this model as well in their IPE development. Um, these are our references, which um, you'll be able to see online afterwards if you want to uh, peruse any of them. And at that point, we will uh, end our comments and look forward to some questions and discussions.